Good evening, everybody. Let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you to session two in our series on theological perspectives on end time events. The format is going to be similar to the format we would have used last week. And by that, I mean, Reverend Jackman, he would present and there would be a break. And that would provide you the opportunity to ask questions. You also have the raise hand that you can use as well. Then in addition to that, you can send questions to the chat. In the event we don't cover all the questions tonight or, or in this session, then we would pick up from next week if the Lord's fear lies. Uh, just before Brother Randy from the Spite Stone congregation would lead us in prayer, um, I would just introduce Reverend Jackman so that right after I'm through, the next voice you will be hearing is Reverend Jackman. Uh, Reverend Edwin Jackman, for those who weren't on last week, is currently pastoring the Church of God at Bell Plain. Uh, he has been pastoring that church for well over 30 years. Uh, what I didn't tell you last week, that he's a retired teacher. Um, he doesn't look that way, but yes, he is a retired teacher. Uh, I would have also mentioned to you that he is a father, husband, and grandfather, uh, a, a very solid man when it comes to the word of God, when it comes to teaching the word of God. I trust that we will benefit significantly from, the, as he shares with us from this, this session, this series, let me say to you that this is not fast food. So, so if you're thinking fast food, then you will have to change the restaurant. But this is heavy stuff. And um, I know that we are going to be the better for it. Regrettably, sometimes when we ask persons what we believe, they cannot clearly articulate what we believe. And then they can't say, in addition to that, why they believe what they believe. And we want to hopefully bring some clarity to this ticklish and dicey subject as it relates to end times. Again, thank you for being on the platform. We trust that God will bless you. God will bless us as we share together. So at this time, Brother Randy Johnson from the Spike Stone Congregation will be for us. Good evening, all. Spray. God, thank you for this occasion. We thank you for your goodness to us during this day. And we pray tonight that as we would examine the truth of your word, that your Holy Spirit would reveal the truth to us. You say to study to show thyself approve unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed of the gospel, rightly dividing the word of truth. We thank you for being with Reverend Jacqueline in his preparation. And we pray as he would deliver that your Holy Spirit will come upon him afresh, and you will anoint him for the task. And we, the listeners, Amen. and your Holy Spirit will interpret this truth to our hearts in the name of Jesus. We commit this session into your hands, and we pray that through this session, your name would receive the honor, the glory, and the praise, and we too will be able to say amen because of the interpretation of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank you, Reverend Aline, for your introduction. And I want to say thanks you to Brother Johnson for your prayer. And I want to say welcome to my brothers and sisters in Christ for session two in our series on theological perspectives of end time events. I believe we're going to be involved in a very interesting dialogue tonight because we're going to be looking in a little more detail on, on the rapture theology, which was mentioned last week as I identified different schools of thought and different perspectives which are identified. 
three main ones being pre-millennialists, the post-millennialists, and the amillennialists. I had indicated last week that since the pre-millennium is the more prominent perspective and its position held by most of the evangelical churches, we will proceed looking at their schedule, their outline of the events as they occur, and we will discuss them and see how they match with the Word of God and how they match with our own perspectives from our own theology. theology. Last week, I identified some important principles which are essential for us to be able to interpret the Word of God accurately. And there are principles that are not only relevant for our studies in eschatology in the series that we're doing, there are principles that are important for any Bible student. So even the casual reader of the word should be able to apply these principles because they're, they're essential if anyone is to gain the correct meaning and the truth as they read the word of God. I would have identified a number of them and I know your memories may not be able to recall all that I identified. But I want to remind you again to make sure you keep your notebooks close at hand that you can record some information and make sure you have your Bibles handy because we're going to be actually going into the Word from tonight. Those principles I outlined, I also indicated to you that as we go through the course of the study, I will be identifying those principles where really they are relevant to any particular theory that we are examining. So I'm going to be constantly reminding you of them. So by the end of the series, even though you may not have been able to recall all of them from the very beginning, as we go through the series and I identify each of them as they occur, you know, I, I believe that they will begin to settle in your in memory. So by the end of the series, you might have a, a very, very good understanding of each of those principles as we apply them to our interpretation of the word of God. They're very fundamental, they're very essential, and that's why it took the time and then play them in, in our first session. First of all, what I want to do tonight is also to look at some questions which we have to answer as we go through the series. Because this study takes us into a, a number of different areas which are all interconnected. So to have a proper understanding, there are some questions which we need to ask ourselves and which we need to seek the answers to as we go through the study. First one, is the kingdom of God present, future, or both? I'm going to go slowly that if you're writing notes, you, you can take these things down. Second question, is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven one and the same? And the reason why I'm going to identify these questions is because they are, they are things that come up in the dialogue and the discussion. And, and, and different people have different perspectives on them. And sometimes they throw the issue in terms of your understanding of what the word of God says, which means that we have to get specific answers to questions to clarify things that are important. And the third one is, is the church spiritual Israel? Or does God have specific promises and plans for Israel as a geopolitical entity that must still be fulfilled. The pre premillennialists hold the view that there's a distinct difference between Israel and the church. And sometimes they accuse people who have the amillennial position, which is the one that we hold, is that we claim that the church has replaced Israel and that God still has distinct purposes and plans for Israel. And the, and the church, yes, came in sort of accidental. But we do not argue that the, the church replaces Israel. What we, what we do say is that as the Apostle Paul teach, he told them merge so that the, the, the Gentiles are grafted in to Israel and become one body. So they are really connected. So the church is made up of Jew and Gentile. So we're not saying the church has replaced Israel. But what we're saying is that we have become spiritual Israel, and that is made up of the body of believers, which will include Gentile and Jew. But we will give 
more detail to that when we look at the kingdom of God and when we look at Israel and the church. So we'll get more detail on that. Our next question, were temple sacrifices a shadow that saw fulfillment in the death of Jesus? Or will they be reactivated in the future? Is the church is the return of Christ divided into two phases? Does Christ return bring an end to man's activity, or does time continue after Christ returns? Is there more than one bodily resurrection and more than one judgment period? Is the millennium a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ on the throne of David in Jerusalem? Or is it a figurative number representing a time period which we are currently experiencing? Nine is Antichrist a person or a system? We're mm -hmm. still getting some background noises, so please remember what Reverend Jefferson said. You have to mute your device, or it will pick up songs on radios, on TVs, and things of that nature. So, so please bear that in mind. Is Armageddon a literal battle, or is it a symbolic conflict between Satan and the church, which culminates in the defeat? of Satan and his evil forces. And then finally, are we going to live on a restored earth? Or are we going to live on a new heaven and a new earth? These are all questions that are very much interconnected and, and all very relevant to the course of study which we're going to be engaged in. And we're going to try to answer these questions as we go through our study series. If there are any questions that you want to add to these that might be part of your thought pattern, things that you might be seeking answers to, which might be connected to eschatology, of course, you can jot those questions down. And when you get a, a chance to respond, you can indicate any other questions you know, which you will want to identify. I want to give you some of the tenets of the rapture theology, because there are a number of things which will be interconnected with that whole theological perspective. So if you believe in the, the rapture as identified by premillennialists, there are certain things that will have to accompany that, which we have to discuss and see if they are connected to what the word of God is saying. Now, sometimes we are inclined to say, as members of the Church of God Reformation Movement, who I said are, are inclined to accept the amillennial position, our theology is based on that. We sometimes say to people that we do not believe in a rapture, but that's not really completely accurate. The premillennialists, the postmillennialists, and the amillennialists all believe in a rapture. It's just the timing that is different. The pre-millennialists are pre-tribulation believers, so they believe that the rapture will occur before the tribulation, and they believe that a specific period of a great tribulation, which will last for seven years, as, as indicated last week. Now, as we go along, I'm going to give you more details on the belief system of each of, of the different uh, perspectives. I'll just give you a synopsis and just a brief idea of the belief systems of these different groups where we're going to get more details. The post-tribulationists post believe that, that the rapture will take place after the tribulation and time will continue. That what we believe is that as the Apostle Paul indicated in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, yes, the church will be caught up, snatched away from the earth. That's where the term rapture is derived from. 
But we believe that that is going to take place at the end of the world. At the end of all things, Christ returns. Dead in Christ will rise first. And as Paul says, we that are alive and remain will be caught up to meet him in the air. And an end comes to all things. So that there's no more time. There's no space for a millennium. We are ushered into eternity. So that's why I said, yes, we believe in, in a rapture in a sense, but not that the rapture takes place secretly and time continues and there's a period of tribulation and then there's a millennial reign and then Christ returns to the earth. So yes, we believe that the snatching up of, of believers. Now I must indicate here that the term rapture it's not seen in the Bible. You will not see it in the New Testament, nor you will not see it in the Old Testament. The term is, is derived from a Latin word that is used in the Latin translation, which is the Vulgate of, of the Bible. And the word there used is rapio, which is a Latin word that's spelled R A P I O. So you can see where the root would lead to our English word rapture. And that means to cash away or to take away. The Greek version of that is harpazo, which is what the Apostle Paul would have used in his writing. So when he talked about Christians being taken away or caught up to meet the Lord, the word that has been translated from the Greek would mean the same thing as the Latin version. But the word harpazo was what the Greek version would have indicated. So if you look in the Bible for the word rapture, you will not actually see it because it's just our English word that we use, which represents the taking away or the snatching up or the catching up of, of Christians. So that's where the concept of the rapture comes in. So there's some questions that we have to ask ourselves as we examine this whole concept. Because the views presented by the premillennialists are completely different from the position which we have. So I want you to be aware of, of what is also connected to this concept of the rapture. For them, the rapture is the first phase of Christ's return. So they believe that the coming of Christ, the return of Christ is in two phases. So the rapture is the first phase where the saints are caught up to meet the Lord in the air and transported to heaven at the great marriage supper of the Lamb, which is their interpretation. Whether they will receive their rewards because they would have a, a separate judgment from the unsaved or what they would consider as the great withdrawn judgment. So that secret rapture would take Christians away, those that were resurrected, and those that were alive when that rapture takes place. They'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and they'll be transported to heaven, where they will receive their rewards at the great marriage supper of the Lamb. There they will remain for seven years because that's when the tribulation supposed to be going on on the earth. As I indicated to you last week, there is no definitive period assigned anywhere in the Bible where tribulation is mentioned. That seven-year period is derived from their interpretation of the 70 weeks of Daniel. As I indicated as well, we're going to take a time, some time to study that passage in Daniel to see what is the correct understanding and interpretation of that passage. But that's where they get that position from. Then they also believe that the rapture is, is secret so that every eye will not see the rapture because Christ appears in, in, in the air, not in bodily form. So nobody will see any image of Christ. So it's a, supposed to be a, a secret rapture. They also indicate in that theological perspective that the rapture is supposed to be imminent which means it can happen at any time. There are no signs remaining to 
be fulfilled. And so the rapture could occur at any time. As I indicated last week, that was their position several years ago. As a matter of fact, there was a, a NASA research engineer who was also a, a Bible student, the name of Edgar C. Wiseman. And he wrote an article entitled 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Occur in 1988. Remember, I tried to explain to you the basis for that is because they believe that when Israel became a state in 1948, that that was one of the signs which would be an indication of Christ soon returning. And since they believe that what Matthew talks about this generation, and you know, a generation is very often identified as a 40 year period. 40 years were added to that 48 to become 88. So it was promoted way back then that the rapture would take place in 1988. So that was the article written by this gentleman. And as a matter of fact, it was a very, very popular um, document. As a matter of fact, it was, it was a book that sold 4.5 million copies. And people believe that to such a, a large degree that even on Christian Broadcast Network, they, they interrupted a lot of their regular programming and they started discussing ways in which you could prepare for the rapture. In 1993, the same guy dropped down to 23 reasons and, and he had a different title now, Why the Rapture Would Occur. And then in 1984, he had a different concept, and his whole idea now was the Earth destruction by fire. So he believed that a nuclear bomb would bring the world to an end. So you see, that sort of, of theological perspective makes people predict things that really should not be part of how we view Jesus' mm -hmm. teaching. Because we will see that the word indicates that. Okay, take off my picture. I'm still hearing some voices in the background. All right, another concept connected to the rapture is that the righteous are taken and the wicked left behind. This end time view would mean that there is more than one bodily resurrection. It would also mean that there will be more than one judgment period. I indicated that just a short while ago. And it will also mean that time does not end with the return of Christ. So all of these are ideas built into this concept of the rapture as proclaimed by the people who hold the premillennial view. What we want to examine as we look at the word is if the word does, if the word teaches these particular elements that have been identified by the people who hold that particular position. Now, I want to say at this point that, you know, we need to give a little rationale for the study of eschatology, because I, I guess some people might be inclined to ask the question, why should we spend all these hours in studying eschatology, where we could spend that time in, in developing our Christian lives and dealing with things that are more relevant to maturing as Christians. As we say, at the end of the day, whether I believe the premillennial view or the postmillennial view or the amillennial view, that is not going to stop me from getting into heaven. Now, that may be possibly true. But there are some people who, because of particular belief, and remember the word says that people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. For example, if you believe that a rapture will take place and then time continues, that will put you in a place of complacency because you would believe that you will have time after the rapture. And really and truly, you would, you would recognize when the rapture is, has taken place. And so if you were living at that particular time, you, you would possibly believe that you have a second chance to make things right, having not accepted Christ in the time that was given to you. So that is where that 
particular uh, teaching to be dangerous. But it, it also influenced our view of the future, our view of, of the world, how we live our lives. Because I remember we were studying one of the Bible commentators who previously believed the premillennial view. And he said he really believed a lot of what was being taught, a lot of the proclamations that were being made, and he was looking forward for the rapture as something very imminent, meaning that it could happen any time. So he said it, it controlled how he viewed family life. It also viewed how he looked at investments, and he made no investments. As a matter of fact, he said that it was only after he changed his position to more of an app millennial view that he increased his family size. That he start making investments and looking at life differently. But before he was just preparing for the rapture, and so he was not really concerned about about a lot about the details of daily life. And if you recall, even back in the Apostle Paul's time, people who believe that Christ were coming in their time, not looking for the rapture, but looking for the return of Christ, they stopped working. And Paul had to encourage them that you really have to work to eat. And it's by the sweat of your bow that you're going to eat food. So do not get into that complex attitude of believing that because you're looking for Christ's return, that you do not live your life in a responsible way. So that is how um, your belief or your eschatological position can impact on your life. And I think why it is important that we study eschatology because we will notice when we go through the scripture that wherever there are comments being made about the future and the coming of Christ, it's always a command and instruction to take care of your life. Live your life responsibly. Give your life in a prepared state that you do not know the hour that Christ is going to return. So it encourages you to live responsibly. So eschatology, yes, has its place. And furthermore, it's part of the word of God. There, there are things that were given prophetically, and there are things that we must read and study because they're part of the word and they're there for purpose. And I believe that this is why we must study it. So don't get the position that it's, it's a waste of time. Um, I think it's very important and as we engage ourselves to even get a better understanding of how important, how significant it is. I want to pick up on the passage of scripture that we're going to look at tonight, give you a, a general overview. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 24. And then I'm going to break. And if you have any questions, you can ask questions in relation to some of the things that I've already said. And then I'm going to look at the specific reference in Matthew chapter 24, which the, the rapture theologians use to justify their perspective. We will look at it and we would apply some of those same interpretive principles. And we will begin to see the relevance of them and why it is necessary that we have the correct interpretation. So we're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 24. You're going to have to go pretty deep in the, in the study of Matthew, that 24th chapter. So it is going to engage us part tonight, but of course we have to continue in, into a next session or maybe two, depending on the number of things that we have to engage ourselves in as we study. And there's a reason for that. So let's pick up from Matthew chapter 24, first chapter, first verse, sorry. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. I'm reading from the King James Version. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So the disciples had great admiration for the temple. It was a magnificent structure. Now the Bible does not go into details about the description of the temple, but if you read extra biblical um, texts and something, it is good to do that because the Bible does not always give all the details that they are. So you have other books that have been written and other historical accounts that will give you some of the details 
that it will help to build your, your general understanding. And it's important sometimes to read other, other texts. And there are books that are referred to as the apocryphal books, which give historical accounts. Some people, you know, question their, their inspiration, but there are books that give a lot of history that we have to understand some details because we're going to make reference to some details that are given in accounts, which we call extra biblical accounts because they're not actually recorded in, in the word, but they are very important historical information that we need also to come to grips with. So the disciples were very amazed at the temple. It was a magnificent structure. It was described as one of the seven wonders of the Roman Empire built by Herod. And so in their admiration, they drew it to Jesus' attention. It is said that the the, the temple was coated with gold at the top that reflected the rays of sunlight. So from, from a very large distance out, you could know that that's where the temple was located. And then it had walls that were made of a very pure marble that looked like a small cat mountain. So it was a beautiful structure and made of some extremely large um, stones, which were very exquisite and very beautiful. So the disciples in their admiration drew it to Jesus' attention. Jesus said unto them, verse 2, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, tell us when these things be. These things refer to what Jesus said, that that temple will be destroyed and not one stone is going to be standing on the other. So that, that question was related to these things. And then the other question was, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So there are two questions being asked in Matthew chapter 24, which I want you to pay very careful attention to because this will engage us very much when we go deep into the study of this particular chapter. And it's also a prophetic chapter because Jesus makes prophecy prophecies in, in this particular chapter. Notice then that there are two questions, so we are going to have two answers given by Jesus in response to the two questions that were asked by his disciples, which they call him aside and privately ask him. This discourse is referred to as the Olivet Discourse because Jesus was on the Mount of Olives. It's also recorded in Mark chapter 13 and Luke chapter 21. Also pay careful attention to the fact that the disciples connected the coming of Christ and the ending of the world. What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? There's a link to that. And notice in what I identified before in the rapture theology, there is not an end at the coming of Christ. Now, those who hold the premillennial view say that they meant the end of the age and not the end of the world. But of course, that is not what the King James Version says. So they will have to read it in another text, which translates it as at the end of the age. But the disciples say the end of the world. What should be the sign of their coming and the end of the world? So therefore, as we go through, Matthew chapter 24, you will recognize that there are two questions that Jesus is answering and why I'm indicating that that is very significant. Yes, I do not see locked in, man. It's because this has led to a difference in, in interpretation in relation to this particular passage. Now, the, the, the premillennials will say, that Jesus answered the second question first. Because when Jesus goes to identify the signs that will be uh, associated with the destruction of the temple, they project these signs as signs that will be fulfilled before the rapture takes place. 
So that's why they will want Jesus to be answering the second question first. But again, that is what they'll be reading into the text. And remember that one of the principles we identified is that you take the text as is. Do not come with a preconceived pre idea and then read your interpretation or your position into the text. If you say that Jesus is answering the second question first, that's precisely mm -hmm. what you were doing because Jesus never indicated that he is answering the second question first. He proceeds to answer the question, and I believe the first answer that is given is in relation to the destruction of the temple, which the disciples asked, and the second part is going to be the, 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 question, the answer to the, the next question, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? We are going to see as we go in to, to, to the answer to those questions, that there's a difference in how Jesus answered the first as compared to how he answered the second. We're going to analyze them. So we're going to go into Matthew chapter 24 in greater detail. What I want to pick up on, which I will draw to your attention at this time and then break, is the part where the premillennialists use as one of the proof texts of a secret rapture that will take place. And they believe that this is supported by the word. And so we go to verse 36. I will indicate at this point that the first part of Jesus' question, question by the disciples is answered up to verse 35. And Jesus begins the second answer or second response at verse 36. And notice how it starts. But of that day and hour, see, they ask him when the temple was going to be destroyed and then what we the sign of his coming and the end of the world. So at verse 36, Jesus prepares now to answer the second question. That's why it starts this way. But of that day, was what he says, of that day and hour, knoweth no man, no, not the angels, of heaven, but my father only. So there anyone try to speculate the time that Christ would return. He says that it is not a time that man will be aware of. So when you speculate and you have to change dates, then I, I question your theological perspective and your position in relation to the world. He proceeds. But as the days of no work, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, until the day that no entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Notice the singular coming, or comings, not two phases, the coming, singular. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, watch the instruction coming out. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. And then he goes on to give some parables which we will look at because this answer goes into chapter 25. So the answer to the second question that was asked the disciples does not end in chapter 24. It goes on to, to chapter 25. Okay, so from verse 39, sorry, verse 40 and 41 is a key text for the, the rapture um, supporters, those who believe in, in that theological perspective of a secret rapture. They use this particular text here to justify that theological perspective. But before I go into the exposition of it, I will pause here and give you a chance, if you want to ask some questions, 
then I will go in the explanation because I guess it will open up um, an opportunity for more questions or clarification on things that we that might come out from the dialogue here. So I pause for any questions, any comments, or perhaps if you have any other areas that you will want us to engage in study, because I, I listed a number of things that we have to look, look that will come into, into our discourse. And if there are any other things that you want to discuss, there's another one which comes to my head even right now, but I don't know if we may have the opportunity to do that. And the question is, is Israelis that we know have living in that land the same or the descendants of the original Hebrew that Jesus made the promises to? Are they the original Jews? How should we view that nation in relation to what was the original concept of God's chosen people and who they were, the ethnic group. So that that is a question that something is raised. I don't know if that is something that anybody would be interested in, in discussing, but that is a, a, a question that has raised a lot of recent dialogue and discussion, and it's very interesting to examine. So I pause here, give you a chance to ask some questions or make any comments. All right, I take your silence to mean that you don't have any questions at this point. I hope everything is, is, is clear for you so far. I hope I'm not going too fast. If you think so, you can tell me slow down. Or if you want me to repeat anything that I would have mentioned or any listing that I have given that you might have missed any detail that you want me to just recap, I can do that. Here in mind, as I said, we, we, we as Jeff indicated, we have lots of time to um, discuss these issues. But I'm going to try to go um, slowly and try to simplify things as much because these are some very, very deep topics. And they are topics that engage some of the best minds. People who are professors in these areas and people who have done significant studies. And um, when we have Difference in their views. Remember that we are dealing, as I said, indicated before, people who are Christian and people who have done a tremendous amount of study. But as I indicated before, it can only be one truth. But so let's ask Jesus, what is truth? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. So the reality is that we can get different opinions, different interpretations, but it can only be one truth. Everybody cannot be right. And we're not going to be arrogant to say that we are the ones that are right. We're going to examine the word and try to justify our particular theology. If you are clear on understanding of what we believe and why we believe it, that I think that is important. I give you just good justification for what you can hold on our theological perspective. But if you see any issues with it, you have the right to, to question those and see answers to things that might not seem to match up with your position. Remember uh, identified? Yes, yes, Jeff. Excuse me, uh, Reverend Jackman. You have two yes. questions. Um, Randy, yes. Randy has a question, and then um, Nikki. So, Randy, you go first, and then uh, Nikki would be second. Yeah. All right, Reverend Jackman. The illustration you just used with two shall be at the mill. Yes. The one person and the other. How do we interpret that? How do we interpret that? in the light of Christ coming. All right, I will get to that. Remember, I just said I will read them, then break for some questions, and, and then we'll continue. So, so that, that will come up in the dialogue. All right, so you will get an answer to that. So that but that's a good question. All right, and the next person is Nikki. Um, your question? 
Good night, Pastor Jackman. I don't have a question. I just wanted you to repeat the verses in which real Jesus replied to the disciples, where he answered their questions from verse 2. Okay. The questions? Do you want to repeat the questions? No, not the questions, just the verses yeah. that Jesus gave. In response, no, you said that in the pre. Okay, okay. I said he gave, he, gave the, he gave the answer after verse um, thirty-five, where it ends: "The heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass." Because what Jesus did is give a, a prophetic um, understanding. Of what will take place, and then he picks up from verse 36, as it's indicated to answer the second question. So you follow what I'm saying? He, en he ended the first question at verse 35, and he picks up the second question from verse 36. And we will, we will get a chance to examine this because I told you we, we have to spend some time in. Matthew chapter 24. So I'll, I'll, I'll go into the more detail on that. Then we come to the next session next week. So, so don't miss next week's session. It's going to be very, very important because I myself have used part of Matthew chapter 24 to make certain statements that refer to, to, to a time to come. And you, will, and you will notice that from the statements that are made by Jesus, that we sometimes think that these are things that refer to the future because the, the theological position of, of the premillennialists got into our heads. Because you remember, as I said, that's the theology that's supported by 70% of evangelical believers. Pentecost assembly, Nazarene version, um, New Testament, Church of God, Church of God prophecy. Um, so, and because most of the books, most of the broadcasts that you're going to see are of that particular persuasion. Sometimes you get drawn into it without even realizing that you might be supporting a theological perspective that is really not your particular interpretation, but because it has come across so often that it has gotten into your head. You see, because the more often something is repeated, the more sometimes it appears as if it is the reality. Right, so Jesus answers the first question and it goes right down to the climax at verse 35 and, and, and verse 36 picks up a different response, which will be the response to the second question. But of that day, an hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but the Father only, because he gave a number of signs showing that the temple is destroyed. So it means that you, you have you will, get, you will know there will be signs that will indicate when that time is happening. So you now know then that he could not have been referring to the same thing in verse 36 because he's now saying that the, the coming of, of the Messiah is not a time that anybody knows. So we can see from that that he's responding to two different questions. All right, so we can proceed then to look at the response to the premillennial position that this part of the text, particularly verse 40 and verse 41, refers to secret rapture. Now, we're going to take our time to do a proper exegesis. And the opposite of that, to exegete the word, is to read the word and see precisely what it is saying to us. If you come to the word with a preconceived position and you want it to try to justify, then you are doing the opposite, which is E-C-G-S-S, E-I, instead of E-X. Those are just words um, for your understanding in case you, you, you hear them mentioned, but you know, don't, don't, don't hurt your head with those. So let's pick up from verse 37. But as the days of no word, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus himself here is drawing an analogy. 
he is, is given us an idea of how to employ the interpretation of the text. Remember we said that one of the principles is that you use other references and you let the Bible interpret the Bible. So Jesus wants us to clearly understand where he is going with this response and he draws an analogy as is, is the similarity here. But as the days of no were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day that no enter the ark. So he's drawing a comparison. Now again, if, if Jesus draws reference to a Genesis account, you can know for sure that it's a historical account. People think that the, the no story is just a story. It, 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 it's just an illustration of something. That when you disobey God, there's judgment. It's an actual historical account because Jesus is making reference to it. And, and it's something that actually happened. And what is the comparison that he's given here? No, not everything that, that happened in the days of no have been identified here. That's why I say that something is important to read extra biblical texts. And there are other texts that will give you some of the things that actually happened in Noah's time that would that were not described here. But Jesus identifies what he is making a particular reference to because. He wants to use that to explain the verses that are going to follow. So life was going on as usual. People were eating and drinking and marrying and giving a marriage. They were going on with life as usual, taking no thought of eternity, taking no thought of the fact that Noah had preached to them about an impending flood and judgment of God or wickedness. And that's what Jesus is alluding to. That people went along with the normal lifestyle until the flood came. And he says, it shall be like that in relation to the coming of the Son of Man. People are going to be living their normal lifestyles, going on with things as usual. I will not be aware until Christ returns, judgment comes, and brings an end to things. Now, the Left Behind movie, if you have viewed it, Nicolas Cage and, and, and Hollywood very often does their research. So when Hollywood give a projection of something, you could well understand that they have interviewed the people with a certain theological position. And if their film is based on that, you're going to see some elements coming out in their film based on that theology. So in that film, you will see people being snatched away. You will see a person in the street and they just disappear out of their clothes and the clothes fall to the ground. You will see skirts and dresses and pants coming down from the sky because people just disappear, being caught up in the, into, the, into the sky and their clothes are, are, are descending. You see um, babies disappearing with the mother's arm. You see cars losing their drivers and, and crashing into poles and buildings and all sorts of things. And you see planes coming down from the sky and crashing. Because if, if Christians are going to be secretly snatched away, all of that is the chaos that will be going on. And that is a perspective that perhaps is suggested in the whole concept of the secret rapture where Christians just disappear. You do not hear a lot of talk about it, but the, the movie projects that. I know you will say that Hollywood might exaggerate things, but there is there is some belief in, 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 in that system of interpretation is that those things will happen. Christians will just disappear from wherever they are, and those things will, will leave a, a chaotic situation. Is, is that what it is going to be like when Christ returns? But if you're proposing a rapture, the possibility is, is that that's what you could be insinuating. Because we believe that when Christ comes, he brings an end to all systems and nothing is going to, to go on in relation to, um, to human existence 
in, in, as a matter of fact, in a natural realm after Christ returns. So Christ is drawing an analogy here. So he is also then going on in verse 40 and verse 41 to make a comparison. Then two shall be in a field. One shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one taken and the other left. This is tying in the analogy that he just used. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking and marrying. Now it's going to be like two at a mill grinding, one taken, the other left. Two shall be in a field, one taken, and the other. People are going on with their normal chores and their normal duties. And then there is a sudden appearance of Christ, not anticipated, not predicted, because nobody knows the hour. So it's going to be a sudden appearance, just like the people were going on with their regular life until the flood came. When rain started to fall, then they realized how serious it was. And when they tried to to rush at the door to get no to enter the time was taken. Now watch carefully what the word does not say. When you're interpreting the scripture, you pay attention to what it says, but you also pay careful attention to what it does not say. It does not indicate here that there is a rapture of people taken up to heaven. They are presupposing that based on their theological interpretation of what happened in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 to 17. So they are bringing that into this text. And the assumption is that those who are taken are those who are raptured. So the presupposition here then will be also that those who are taken are Christians. And those who are left behind are the unsaved. That's what the movie Left Behind also projects. The people who are being snatched up and disappearing from the cars and the planes and the buses and the trains, all of those things are the Christians. And the ones that are left behind are the unsaved. Now, this text does not tell us that. Note it carefully. It does not say that the those who are taken, two shall be grinding at a mill, one taken and the other left. It does not say that the one taken is a Christian and the other one left is unsaved. The text does not say that. So we will be making an assumption. We will be reading into the text what it does not say. It does not say that. Now you might argue, but it could be reasonable to assume that. It might be reasonable to assume that, but the text does not say it. Now, when we go to the comparison that Jesus is making, it's very important that we make that analogy. It, it's critical. He says, as in the days of Noah, it shall be in a similar manner at the coming of the Son of Man. How was it in the days of Noah? We're eating and drinking until the flood came and took them away. Now, who were taken in the flood? That's a rhetorical question. It's not the Christians that were taken away in the flood. It was the unsaved people, the covenant breakers, those those people who did not listen to the word and prepare themselves, they are the ones that were taken away in the flood. Those who remain were the Christians, the, the ones that were obedient to the God's purpose and God's will. That's Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. They remain. So that is contrary to the perspective that the premillennists are using this verse to interpret and base their position on. They are assuming that the ones taken are the ones that are Christians 
And the next question, where are they taken? There is no indication here that the, that the ones taken are taken up in the air at the rapture and goes to be with the Lord. And if we make reference back to the Thessalonian passage, which we look at, when Paul says that the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive and remain together with them will be caught up to meet him in the air. He does not say that we are taken to heaven for seven years to the great marriage supper of the land of the Lamb, where we will receive our reward and be judged. He does not say that. He just says that the dead in Christ will rise and the, the, those that are remaining alive as Christians together will be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air and there we shall be forever with the Lord. We are right. Yes. Yeah, uh, we have uh, either a question or comment. All right. Bev. Uh, Bev, you can go ahead at this time. Yes. So I'm not sure if Bev is hearing. Um, or she might need to unmute her mic if she wants to speak. Her question was posted or she's, she's going to ask the question verbally? It was just the raised hand. So you can continue. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Right, so, so there are two things not said there. It is, it is no indication of the, the, spirit, the spirituality of the persons. We don't know if there are two Christians, two unsaved, two saved, or one saved and one unsaved. What it does say is that it is going to be light. And I believe that Jesus is using an analogy here that people are going to be going on with their normal life and there's going to be a separation. And the Bible does indicate that there'll be a separation. And we will go on to look and see Matthew chapter 25 talk about the separation, sheep separating from the goat. And we all know which category is identified as Christian and non-Christian. So yes, there is going to be a separation. And this verse does indicate that there will be a separation. We, we can conclude that from this. Two shall be in a field, one taken and the other left. Two shall be grinned at the middle, one taken and the other left. So when Christ returns, there is definitely going to be a separation. He will send his angels to gather from the four corners of the earth. And he will separate as a shepherd, divided his sheep from the goat, and there's going to be a separation. And that separation is going to indicate who is going to reign with Christ eternally in, in, in heaven. Or as some people will say, on the earth restored. And remember, that's one of the questions that we will try to answer from the, from the word. Are we going to be taken to heaven? Or are we going to live on the earth restored? That is a question that has been asked by people in, in, of different theological perspectives. And we will examine that. But some people believe that we're going to be living back here on the earth restored. So we don't have to analyze what just meant when he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you onto myself, that where I am, there you be also. Then we have to take into consideration John saying he saw a new heaven and a new earth. Is it brand new or a new brand? Is it a completely different earth that Jesus is preparing and that John saw coming down? to replace where this old earth has occupied? Or is it going to be an earth restored, brought back to its Edenic duty and what God's original intention would have been for the earth? Some people believe that. But, but scriptures give us an understanding which we will examine as we go along. We will not try to answer that fully now, but that's one of the questions. So and back right. here to the thoughts. Yes. So we have Percival with a, a question. Yes. Uh, Percival. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Good night. Good night. Uh, let me go back a little bit, Pastor Jack, man. How far back are you going? Not too far back, not too far back with the, with the, um, the same you, text. When you mentioned here at 40, 40 when yes. you just said as it was, they like, didn't they, they, they know. All right. Yes, yes. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to figure out why would Jesus make that um, concept or mention that to, to, to his people as, as an analogy and not speaking and not primarily speaking about his own people that he's coming back for. Even though you are saying, even though it's not clear here, say, if it is Christian or not Christian. Right. Right. I, I, I understand that, but I, I'm saying, so why would Jesus make that statement if he's not coming back for his people? And because the, that, that, that is, is, is his sole um, concept for his return, but for, for his people. So I guess FF, even um, Revelation, Revelation 20 also mentioned that, that between uh, Revelation 21 and 6 mentioned that also that, that he became back again for, for, for his people. If I, if I read it and understand it, and it's, it's, it's authority. Yes, but, but, but Richard, he's not only coming back for his people. He's also coming back to bring judgment on the unsaved. Yes, I, 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 I right. I, so I, Revelation, Revelation also makes that clear. The books were open, and those not found written in the book of life. See, so, so, so that's where the separation is, is is occurring. But yes, Christ is coming back for His people, but He's also coming back to bring judgment on those people who are not His people, the covenant breakers who refuse to to, to accept the word of God and repent and change their lifestyles to match what Christ's purpose and will was for their lives. So they're not going to escape the judgment. So he, yes, he's coming back as a judge and he's also coming back to give reward to those who were obedient and those who obeyed it. It's, it's, it's a covenant, covenant they take. Right, right. I, I understand that whole thing. So yes. Hey, if I came home to from work, and to, to, to punish my, my children, I, I did it primarily the ones that uh, I want to uh, reward the ones that are good, I give it them. And they, yes. punish, they, they punish the ones that are dis disobedient. So uh -huh. I'm, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to remove my, my, uh, my, my, my people first and then give it the unsafe ones that are dis disobedient. Right now, I remember God and he said, I he didn't know God put no family in an ark. Yeah. Separation, separation again, separation from, right. from but, 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 but watch it, Richard. Watch it carefully again. Watch, watch, watch the text and analogy. They were not removed from the flood. While people were outside drowning in the flood. Their boat was rocking and tossing, and they're going through the same experience. It's only that they are going to survive because the ark was prepared for their safety. And God has prepared a place for us where we will dwell in, in eternal safety. And those people who have accepted God's law will, will gain as a result. So, right. so he, he, he did not rapture them away. But okay. been, that's why they, that's why there are people who believe. That tribulation will come on the earth, but but that the Christians will go through tribulation. Now, the, 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 the people who are of the rapture position believe that there are verses in the Bible that supports that, that position. There are two verses that they quote. For God have not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. First Thessalonians 5, 9. And they use that as a verse to indicate that God has not appointed us to wrath, so therefore he's going to take us from it. Well, that, what that means is that it's not God's will that any shall perish. 
but that all should right. come to repentance. See? And then there's another verse they use in Revelation 3 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation or trial, which shall come upon all the world to try them upon the earth. I shall keep thee from it, me protect thee from it. Because no was kept from the judgment that the whole world was going through, but they were in the ark on the same water. Yeah, but see, see um, remember, I remember that that after that, God said that that he that he was not put man through that protected thing again because he sent the rainbow as as a fight, as I've or uh, remember way that he won flood the earth. But we're talking about um, flood. He, he will not flood the earth, but that does not mean he will not judge the earth. He will still judge the earth, but not by that method. Right, right. But not by that method more. Good. Right. Now, um, biblical historians are saying today that that Christians are being, um, let's say, we, we are going through our own thing here on earth right now, our own tribulation on earth right now. Today, yeah, we, yes. Today, um, our own trials every day here, here on earth. So that, that is that true. Of tribulation that we that we are going that we are going through. I, I just have research on uh, this week. So, yeah, so but Richard, but Richard, don't don't stretch the tribulation too far. We're going to get to that. I want to know if you think that that these verses justify the theological position that there's going to be a secret snatching up of Christians from off the earth. Yeah, I believe that. You believe that this, that you believe that this verse is saying that? Yeah, because he part time on, I, I, son. Richard, listen to me, right? It, it is not say that. I think you have, as you have indicated, you have come with a background of a, of a, of a particular theological position. And that's what very often happens. People come with a particular position. That that is why, Richard, we, we still have a lot of people who will argue for the Friday crucifixion rather than another day, because the, the, the theological position that a lot of people have come from is that the day before the Sabbath, the day before the Sabbath is is is, is the seventh day Sabbath is a Saturday. So people hold that position rather than looking at the possibility of a Passover Sabbath. I'm just saying that. To make the point that sometimes we come from a particular background that make us interpret the word in a particular way. We're not that we're discussing that dialogue in it. So, so my point to you is, yes, you might, you might believe in in the in a, in a rapture, but this verse does not support that position because it does not say that Christians are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It does not indicate even that they're they're caught up anywhere. Those people who are taken, the people who are taken in judgment. But also, did I say that? Did I say that? I, I guess to me, to me, this is a matter of interpretation. Yes, we, but I'm not saying that. That's the point I'm making. Because so it could also suggest something different. So you can't conclusively say that it is supporting a rapture. And based on the analogy that Jesus used, that's why I tell you, look at what Jesus is using, and He's using it for a purpose. So you cannot justify. The rapture position based on this verse. I remember what I say. There are a number of other things that are associated with the rapture, which we will have to look at as we go through the study of two uh, resurrections, bodily resurrections, of more than one judgment, of time continuing after Christ returns. And we have to look at the scriptures and see what does the scripture say. Does the scripture indicate two resurrections or more? Does the, in, the scripture indicate um, two or more judgments? Does the scripture indicate that time goes on after Christ returns? Or does the scripture indicate that there's an end of everything when Christ returns? That is how we come to the correct conclusion and interpretation of, of that particular theological perspective. So this part here is just an indication of what they use to support the rapture, and I'm saying they can't use this to support the rapture because there are other perspectives that you can have on it. So you can't conclusively say that this supports a rapture. And I'm more inclined to use the comparison that Jesus himself is using because he uses the analogy. Remember, Jesus never talked about a rapture. Interestingly enough, 
there's, there's no discourse where Jesus talks about the rapture. And there is nowhere where the, the, um, the, the apostles speaking about Christ's return talk about the rapture. And there's nowhere in the Old Testament that you see a rapture. So, so you have to question that theological position based on the evidence of the text that you're looking at. So that is, that is how we have to view it. And you have to ask yourself, if this is such an important event to take place, why didn't Jesus mention it? Why? There's, and a, Hebrew, the same hmm? there's a Hebrew word in my uh, name. Papa, uh, I can't get it. It's, it's spelled H A R P A Z O, which, which, which means is is in Hebrew, which means um caught up. Yeah. I uh, um. Yeah, but we don't have a problem caught up in our church. Remember, I told you that that, that 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 can happen at the end of the world. It's also interpreted as rapture. Do, do we take no, 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 no. Harpazo is a Greek word. It means the same, it means the same thing as the Latin word that I, I indicated to you at the beginning, which means to catch up or to snatch away. We don't have a problem with that. When Christ comes back, the Christians are going to be caught up to meet him in the air. And, and incidentally, there's another Greek word which you perhaps may not have realized that it, 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 it means to meet. And that word is taken from the, the, the concept of the culture and the tradition of the time. That when, when a, a dignitary is coming in to, to a, a place, the people will go up to meet him and return. And that's the Greek word that is used when Paul says they're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. So they're not meeting to go to heaven for seven years. They're meeting to come back with him and his triumph and glory to bring an end to all things. So that when Jesus even um, came in to Jerusalem on what we call the Palm Sunday, what does the word say in John chapter 12? Look at it. The same concept. The people went out to meet him and returned with him. That was the culture of how you treat dignitaries. So the, the going is not going in the sense that these people are projecting, snatching away to go up to heaven for seven years. You will, you will meet Christ in the air and return. He's a dignitary. There can't be any greater dignitary than Jesus. So the same Greek word is used to, to connect to that concept. I remember, as I said, when you interpret the scripture, watch for the culture, watch for the intent, watch for the meaning. So we're sure we're going to have to break you on that point because the want to get questions is 10 to 9, and we're going to stick to our time. Yeah, I'm but, I think, yes. So 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 harpazo is a Greek word, means to cut the statue or the cash away or the takeaway. Same thing as the Latin version from which we got our word rapture, but you're not going to see rapture in the Bible. And as I indicated before, there's no problem with the cashing up. We believe in the cashing up. The post millennials believe in the cashing up, and so do the pre. We have a difference in the timing and what happens after that. That's the point I'm making, which is the critical interpretation that, that really makes a difference. All right, so we pause you there. We can elaborate on that in the next session, but I want to give a few other people, if they have questions, to ask or make those statements. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. As I, as I indicated before, Paul promise is always to preserve his people and to keep them from things that have the potential to destroy. And when God brings judgment, we have indications that he keeps his people, he preserves them. You don't have to be raptured to be preserved. You don't have to be caught up in the air. So we believe that, that that's the promise of God. God will always look out and protect his people. He did it for Noah. He protected them 
from the destruction that came in the antediluvian world. He protected righteous law, as the Bible indicates, by bringing him out of the city. When the city was, this, was destroyed, but he was not raptured. Lot stayed on the, on the mountain and, and, and saw the, the city burning and going up in flames. We also have the children of Israel in, 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 in Goshen, which was adjacent to the land where all the plagues and, and those things were going on, judgment on those people and destruction, and God protected his people from them. The death angel came and swept away all the firstborn in Egypt, and the children of Israel did not lose their firstborn. So yes, God will protect us from the hour of trial, and there is a, there's an hour of trial that will come upon the world, which is God's judgment, and God will protect his people from that. All of those people that are, are God's people will be protected. There are a lot of things that right now that God is protecting us from. That are impacting the world. In all cases, in, in, in the realm of our normal existence, it is true that God does not always protect us from things. Sometimes Christians are called to suffer and to go through things. And when we go back to look at the, the judgment that came on Jerusalem, there were people that were connected um, to Christ that would have suffered on those things. But we will see when we look at that scripture and we look at the history of it, that a lot of Christians escaped. And there was, there was a reason for that because they listened to the word of God. That when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, you flee. So I will give you a historical background to that, that you understand that text in an even better light and an even greater light than you might have previously understood. That's why I say it's important to, to learn the history and, and the culture that we, we bring more meaning to interpreting a text. All right, so I believe that that's it's how that particular text can be viewed and not that it is indicating that there's going to be a rapture to save us from the hour of trial. Uh, Reverend Jack Moon, yes, we have a question from Pastor Ralph, Ralph Hinton, yes, and, and Randy also has a question as well. So we okay. have two questions, um, sure, yeah. So Ralph and then Randy, you just need to unmute, unmute. Um, yeah, Brother Ralph. yeah, good night, Reverend Jackman. Yes, sir. Yeah, you. my question. My question is: um, Last week you mentioned that you cannot take uh, words and from the, from the Bible as you can't take everything as literal. Right. Okay. There's some um, things are figurative. So, right. I understand that. Yeah. So in the the Church of God stance of uh, millennium. It is obvious that a thousand years would have passed. Um, can you say that? Um, can, can you use that scripture that a, a day, a um, disciple of the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years of the day to 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 justify uh, the the word millennium there? No, I, I would not. I would not use that because that all that is saying is that time does not matter with God. God is beyond time. You see, because God exists in eternity, time time is is set for us because we live within the constraints of time. But God, who's an eternal God, time doesn't matter. So, is it a thousand years? It's just as if it's a day in God's eyes. For human beings, a thousand years is a long period of time. And, and we are we are time creature. Time matters to us. We are controlled by time. But God is past, present, future. God, God is eternal. So time does not matter for God. God was there even before the earth and universe was created. See, and that, that is what that is suggesting. A thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. So it doesn't matter. So we, we cannot use that verse. Um, to spiritualize the millennium. But what we are indicating is that the book itself, and we will do some studies in, in Revelation. We won't study the whole book, but there are important references that we have to study. The book of Revelation itself is based on symbols. 
numbers are used as symbols, animals are used as symbols. And therefore, it would not be far removed to, to interpret numbers symbolically. That, like for example, when, when the word says that, that um, God owns a thousand cattle on, on, on the hill, it, it, it's, not, it's not referring to just a thousand because God owns more than a thousand cattle. It is it's symbolic of a large number. It is symbolic, but it's not meant to be a specific number because that's not all he owns. Right. So what we're saying is that that period mentioned in Revelation fits in to what is symbolic throughout the whole book and the number can be. And when we begin to look at what happens in that millennium, we would we be would be, be more certain that it cannot be speaking of a precise, specific period of time that it's a period. Were, it's yes, a period it's, of time. it's just a period of time, which is a, an extensive period of time. It's a long time. It signifies a long, a long time. time, but it could be more. As a matter of fact, it would be more than a thousand years, but it's right. not specific. But it started at Christ's resurrection, and it will end at his return. And we do not know the hour he is coming, so we cannot prescribe the time. It could it could, it could be a period that goes much longer than that. So it's an indefinite period of time. And when we look at it as to what is happening in that thousand year period, we can see that it's not even referring specifically to what people think it is referring to. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, Randy, then yours will be last because we were at nine o'clock. Yeah, Reverend Jack, you didn't, the question I asked earlier, yeah. how do we interpret two by the field and one taken in one leaf? How do we interpret that? I didn't hear you make a response to it. Yes, I said that we, that is just being used as an analogy, like what Jesus okay. is using. Mm -hmm. Probably I know if he moved away, but I didn't hear it. it yeah, it's, a, it's an analogy as to the sudden, unexpected return of Christ to bring an aim and to bring judgment just as it was in the days of Noah. That okay. people were eating and drinking, meaning they were going on in their regular lifestyle, he is saying that in our time it is going to be the same. It is going to be as if, as it was in the day. This is still the same type of comparison. Two shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, and the other left. That's unexpected. You wouldn't expect something like that to happen. Two shall be in 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 a field, one taking the other left. So he is using an analogy here. He's not specifying a, a specific rapture event. He is saying that his return. It's going to catch people by surprise unexpectedly while they are engaged in their normal activity. Sleeping in a bed, grinding at a mill, <laughs> working in the field. And Christ is going to return and bring an end to all of that. And then, as I said, it can also indicate that separation will be taking place. Because the word indicates that there's going to be a separation at the end. But we can't conclude from this that it is saying that the righteous people are snapped up and the unsaved remain. The text does not say that because it does not even describe the spiritual condition of the people. It just says two shall be grinding up and they won't take the other left. So I'm saying it is using it as an illustration, as, a, as an allegory or as a type comparing to what Jesus identified as it was in the days of Noah. People doing their regular things and then the flood came. So it shall be at the return of Christ. People will be doing their regular things. People will be at the table eating. People might be partying. People might be at the beach. It's not necessarily two in the, in the, at the middle one taking the other left. People will be engaged in all sorts of activities and Christ comes and you are taken. There's a separation. Sheep separated from the goat. Righteous separated from the righteous. One goes into eternity in bliss and the other goes into judgment and eternity. That's our position on, on that. All right, so I want to say thank you again for the in, engagement. And I, I hope that people get the confidence to, to ask their questions. And, you know, don't feel free. I'm sorry, don't feel afraid to, to, to give your position. And if you disagree with me, be able to state that freely. There, there's... There's no antagonism here. And, and they said, I, I, I'm not the phone of all knowledge. 
I, I depend on the Lord just as you would. And we are all reading and studying together. And I want you to feel comfortable with your questions. And even if they disagree with my position, state them. We discuss them. I show you my perspective. You show me yours. And we can conclude from the word what we believe um, the, the Lord will be saying to us. So I want to say thank you for engaging me again and for being part of the study. I'm looking forward to seeing you, as I said. More exciting things to come, but we're going to look a little deeper now at Matthew chapter 24 because we're, we're going to be connecting that as well to the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation, not using the King James, the specific book, which is a different article, is not using the King James version. We see Great Tribulation. So I say good night to you all. Jeff, back over to you. All right. Thank you, Reverend Jackman. Again, it was really a pleasure having you and having you share with us on this platform. Um, special thanks also goes out to those who would have joined us. Um, I believe we would have had persons from Trinidad. Um, again, uh, maybe some other countries and territories. I'm also aware that we might not have all persons on the platform from Church of God. So to all persons who would have made it tonight to be a part of the experience, we want to say thank you. Um, looking forward to seeing all of you next week, if the Lord spare lives. As I indicated earlier, we have set up the platform to accommodate 500, so you don't have to worry. We, we can have you on. So I'm going to ask, as I would affectionately call her, Lady Rose, Roseanne King, from the Church of God Jackson to close us in prayer at this time. Lady Rose. Father, this evening we bless your name for your word. For your word is truth. Your word is light. Your word gives life to us. And we want to say thank you. Father, the end times can be a scary time to exist. Our world is becoming a scary place in which to exist. And God, there are many persons who would fight the truth, speak against the truth, and even oppress those who believe in and stand for the truth. Father, we thank you that you are truth. We thank yes. you, God, yes. for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for Reverend Jackman tonight, God. Thank you for giving him wisdom and understanding. And even as he delves further in this study, I pray, dear Father, that even the things he may not understand, that you would continue to open his understanding. You would give him the wisdom, God. Father, we bless your name tonight. I pray, dear God, that you would increase our ability to discern those things that are false. For God, even the devil can, can quote scripture. And in this time, in this closing time, God, whether it be two years, 10 years, or 100 years, God, I pray that you would help us to see beyond the human skin that we are so accustomed to and that would be alert to what is true, what is honest, what is just, what is of good report. God, what is coming from you? For you are the greatest truth teller of all. Amen. I pray to yeah. Father that even as you are the only person who knows when the last day will be, that God, right. we will keep connected to the power for you are power. You are omnipotent. You are omnipresent, God, and you are omniscient. And so, God, we draw closer to you tonight. And even as we go on from this night onward, God, I pray that you would empower your people. You would strengthen us, God, where, where there are persons who may feel like giving up, even in these times. I pray, dear Father, that they would be drawn closer to you. So, Father, tonight we bless your name. We praise you again. We thank you for the word. And may we continue, God, to, to, to get into your word and to get your word into us, God, as we see the signs of the times, which point more and more to your coming. Father, we bless your name and we praise you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Amen and Amen. 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 Well, Amen. God bless you. Amen. And have a great night, everybody, and a wonderful day tomorrow if the Lord spare life.